I'm uh, Ida, and I am the secretary of IEEE Women in Engineering. And I'm going to give you a little introduction about what IEEE is, what do we do, and what our main goals are. Okay, um, so IEEE is the world's largest professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. IEEE Women in Engineering is a global network of IEEE members dedicated to promoting and inspiring women around the world to follow their academic interests in a career in engineering and science. We are one of the world's leaders in changing the face of engineering. Our global network connects nearly 20,000 members in over 100 countries to advance women in technology at all points in their lives and career. At our organization, our main vision and mission is to be able to facilitate the recruitment and the retention of women in technical disciplines globally. We want to be able to build a community of IEEE women and men using their diverse talents to innovate for the benefit of humanity. We want to address ways to improve the climate for women and workers. Uh, Over the past couple of uh, years, we've been able to well, prepare we workshops. Well, do open Zoom meetings, stuff. but I think you're going to have to just turn it off because it's started now. Um, seminars, both in person and online in different fields, such as AI, innovation, psychology, electronics, and business. If you have any more questions about IEEE Women in Engineering, feel free to email me at ida at bbartech.ca. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker and instructor, Prof. Jeff Edmonds. Jeff Edmonds has been a computer science professor at York University since 1995, after getting his bachelor's at Waterloo and his PhD at University of Toronto. His background is theoretical computer science and his passion explaining, is explaining fairly hard mathematics to novices. Um, he has never done anything practical in machine learning, but he's eager to help you understand the musings about the topic. So thank you for uh, being here, Prof. Jeff Edmonds. The floor is yours. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Excellent. All right. So, all right. We got my screen here. Yep. So let me start by saying how excited I am to be here with you all and thank you for coming. And uh, I've been a little nervous because I don't really know, I didn't really know who the audience was gonna be, but when I flip through the faces I recognize, they're all friends, which tell me I'm doing okay. Um, so I, it's gonna be quite an introductory. So if you're an expert at machine learning, you might get bored. Um, but I'm hoping to present it in a way where anybody can understand it. And if you don't understand uh, what I'm currently saying on the particular slide, then definitely stop me and ask questions. Um, but if you have something, uh, a broader question, then let's leave it to the end. Um, so let's start by kind of comparing coding and uh, neural nets. So you probably all know about coding. It, each line of code was painstakingly written by some um, coder and it works really well for simple tasks. You have to tell the computer exactly what you want it to do and that's what it will do. So in contrast, uh, a neural net, what it does is based on the weights on each of the edges. Each edge has a, a real number and uh, these weights are far too hard to understand. Um, just like the brain's too hard to understand, you'll never understand what these weights are doing. And so where do they come from? They come from a really simple learning algorithm uh, that looks for patterns, correlations in the data and uh, learns the weights using that pattern. So in the, the 80s, uh, the machine, machine learning, the, the expert systems world wanted to uh, be able to get robots to walk or things and it completely failed. And the reason it failed is that though we all know how to walk ourselves, it's hard to explain to somebody else who's never walked before like a robot, uh, how to do that. 
Um, while in contrast, walking has enough of a pattern to it that uh, um, the machine learning algorithm can find that pattern and learn how to do it. Uh, let me first say that I find this whole process quite magical. It, it sort of reminds me of, uh, it, or it even it explains to me how uh, we evolved ourselves, if you believe in evolution, um, because if you have some sort of system and it has this random change happens and that random change is encouraged with feedback to go in the right direction, then what can emerge can be quite awe-inspiring. Um, and so similarly uh, with machine learning, we give it a little feedback from our supervisor, our training data, and uh, we get complexity that is quite surprising. Um, mm -hmm. And as I say, I find that all kind of oddly spiritual. So Sorry, you, Jeff. Yep. Uh, I have to interrupt you. There are a couple of people that they cannot join because you are the oh. host and you oh. are the only person who can let them oh, in. Oh, right. I Sorry for that. All right, let's Thank admit you. all. Can we say always admit all? Yeah, you can, please. Admit Thank all. You. Um, waiting room. I don't know how to, I've never had a waiting room. So if somebody could keep monitoring that and I would welcome to the people who just arrived. Um, we are talking about machine learning, I guess you know. And uh, we, we all know the, the amazing applications that um, hopefully will will change the world right. in positive ways. And, uh, and protect against vision loss. Visit and then we also, uh, oh, this one I had to stick in because Toronto is, is just starting a, a shuttle program, which is going to be a self-driving shuttle program to pick people up at the train station and take them home. So I'm excited about that. And then we, we also know about uh, all these scary applications that uh, hopefully won't make the world a worse place. And we will talk more about these, all these applications on, on the, the 7th. You know, we have seven talks. So on the seventh one is going to be about um, ethics. And we'll talk about these applications then. All right, so to begin with sort of the mathematics of it, let's have an overview of how it all works. And I really do believe that everything I say today, um, everybody here should be able to completely understand. So if, as I said, if there's something about the page we're talking about you're not getting, then, then holler. So here's our robot. And the goal of the robot is to learn to identify faces and bicycles. So this might be what the architecture of, the, of the, his brain looks like. And uh, what happens is, what our goal is, is an image will come in and it will say face. An image will come in, it will say bicycle, right? And uh, to help the, the robot, the machine learn, um, we'll have a supervisor. And she has just tens of thousands of thousands of training data and each training item will have an input, which in this case is an image, and the appropriate label, which in this case is saying face or bicycle. And uh, she's going to help the machine learn. Um, and I've sort of indicated or maybe already that uh, what controls the machine are these weights. So just think about them as knobs on the machine that set some real value parameter. And you can turn these knobs to get the machine to do what you want. And we're gonna start with, uh, we don't know how to set these values at all ourselves. So we're gonna start with completely random values and uh, we will slowly change them. So at some point in time, we're gonna have um, our current, you know, here we are at some point in time and we have current values. So what are we gonna do with these current values is, well, before we do anything with them, let's, 
let's try to visualize them somehow. And we can think about this vector of real values, uh, putting the machine um, in some location in um, the, the weight space, right? Here's a space of all possible weight settings and our machine is sitting at one of them. Now in this image, we only have two weights uh, and they give the longitude and latitude of where our machine is sitting. But you know, really there are, there are thousands of weights. And so this is a thousand dimensional space, but let's, let's not think about that because that'll scare us. All right, and so the location of the, of the machine then specifies the, the weights, which in turn specifies uh, exactly what this machine does. All right, so let's take our current settings and we're gonna feed through it all of the thousands and thousands of training data items, right? So the first image comes in and it says it's a bicycle and the second image comes in and it says it's a face and uh, and we and of course it didn't do that well but you know we did give it random weights so you don't expect it to do that well and um, you we're, we're going to give all those answers over to the supervisor and she's going to evaluate how well the machine does when it has these weights and she's going to compare the correct answers to the answers that the machine gave and uh, accumulate all that information into one number, which will be called the error. And we're going to uh, visualize that by where the machine is standing, right? He's standing somewhere specified by the weights and where he's standing, we're gonna put a height, uh, which indicates how well the machine did with those weights, right? That's the error. All right, and now the machine needs to learn. And the way it's gonna learn is just to make small changes to each of the weights. And it's gonna, it's gonna get the supervisor to help it again. The supervisor is gonna tell it which of the weights seem to help give right answers and which of the weights seem to be influencing the wrong answers. And as such, the machine will make just little teeny changes in each weight. And then it's standing, because it's made those changes, it's standing somewhere at a different location. Those different location, that different location specifies different weights of our machine so that it will now do different things. So we repeat what we just said. We feed all the thousands of training data through. And for each image, for each input, it gives some output and we give all those outputs to the supervisor who compares the correct answer to the answer given by the machine. And again, she evaluates that with some weight. And you see the weight is a little shorter. Uh, this pole here is a little shorter. Why? Because the air is a little better because it, the machine learned and is doing a little better now. All right, so that's, that's the whole process. All right, and um, now, I'm gonna tell you something that we can't do computationally because it's too big of a task, but it's, th it's, it's more of a thought experiment. Suppose that we did the same process for absolutely every place that the machine could learn, right? Every place we set that specified the weights on the machine. We, pr we put all the data through the machine. It gave answers. And for each of those locations, the supervisor says what the error function, you know, how, the, how much error there is. And if we do that for every location, then that defines some error surface. And you can see the red locations are on top of a hill. So there the air is really high and we don't like those spots. And down here in the valley, the air is really small. And those are the places where the weights are such that we get lots of right answers. And our goal is to find the low place in, in the space. Um, and how are we gonna do that? It's, uh, it's an algorithm called steepest descent. So when my son, Josh was little, we were climbing a hill 
And I said to him, Josh, how do you find the top of the hill? And he says, you just keep going up. And I said, how do you know when you get to the top of the hill? And he says, you can't go up anymore. And so that is our entire algorithm, right? We're going to start at a random place and uh, we're gonna keep going down in this direction of the steepest direction until we get to a valley where we can't go down anymore. And then we will hope that the error is sufficiently small that we get the correct answers. All right, does that make sense? Now, just to make, you know, you might be saying, hey, why don't you just stand at the top of the hill and look around and find the valley? But the problem is you're completely blindfolded. So we don't only have two weights. We have thousands and thousands of weights. So this is a thousand dimensional space. And for any particular, uh, ca any calculation you want to do is going to take huge amount of computation. So you can't just say, look around. All right. All right. So that is my complete uh, a summary of the entire topic. All right. And uh, before we go on, uh, let me tell you something about abstract thinking. So in this talk, as we often do in mathematics, we're, we're going to say very few specifics, right? We're, we don't need to talk about the nature of the machine that we're building. We don't need to talk about the nature of the input X or the output Y, right? We did give specific examples of this might be a neural net and X might be an image and Y might be a labeling cat or dog, but those are just examples. We don't need to be giving you any information about those, right? And if we were looking at um, images and trying to recognize them as a face, then uh, we will never mention noses, right? So the first time I ever gave this very talk, uh, some students said, yeah, but what about their nose? And so I'm trying to, imp I added this slide here to, to let you know we're never going to talk about noses. All right. Now, Jeff, I'm why, sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. we still have some people uh, waiting? That's right. Let's, I'm going to, I got an emit button here. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry me. to do this. Do you want to no give me the host? Uh, do you want to transfer it so I don't bother about you with this later on? Oh, that would require me figuring out how to do that. Um, it's all right. You just holler periodically and I'll welcome the new people. I got a okay. button right here. I can just press. Thank you so much, Jeff. Sorry. All, all is, all is well. We're, so welcome, people. We just finished the intro and we're talking about we're talking about not talking about noses. All right. So why do we not talk about all of this stuff? And the reason is it helps us focus in on the parts that are important. Important. We simplify and say, what do we need to talk about on this slide? Because we can't talk about everything all at once. And the second reason we do this is because if we don't tell you the nature of a machine or the nature of the problem, then everything we say will work equally well, no matter what model of computation you're using, no matter what um, the computational problem is, no matter you know, what your input and your output is. It will, it will work no matter what. All right, and so my recommendation when you're listening to me is not to think about, oh, what should Jeff be saying? He should be talking about noses now. Instead, uh, trust me that, that I'm gonna say in each slide something that's the next thing you should learn and uh, try to focus on what I'm trying to say on that slide. And if you don't understand what I'm currently saying on the slide, then certainly, uh, unmute yourself and holler. I, I probably won't notice the chat. Maybe somebody else will notice it. Um, and uh, that's, but if you, if you have something, a uh, question off topic, then uh, we'll talk about it at the end. All right, so now let's go back to, right? We're gonna, re we're gonna keep going through these, re these same ideas over and over again. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just uh, list the topics 
that we talked about already. So we'll have a sense of what the key topics are. And if you don't quite feel you understand that topic, don't worry, we're gonna cycle through them again in more detail. All right, so the, the, the first issue is that we're assuming that out there in the universe somewhere is a function that we're trying to learn, right? So it takes some input X and then the yellow curves will tell you the corresponding output y and that's what we're trying to learn and in order to learn it we're going to have a, a huge uh, database of training data and each of those training data items is going to be one of these points and you'll see it has some x value which is its input which might be the image and it has some y value which we're assuming is provided by the supervisor. Um, and it might be plotted here, or um, it might be you know, a label face or bicycle. And uh, so that's our training data. Then the next topic we're going to talk about is machines. And the machine of interest these days is uh, these deep neural nets. So we'll talk about them. But really all you need to know about them is you give them some x value as input and they give you some y value as output so here see this green curve here that is 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 representing what the machine will do you give it some x value it gives you some y value and of course the goal of the machine is to approximate uh the answers given by the supervisor as best as possible all right, so here you can see the green curve is trying to fit the, the purple training data, right? Now, the other only other thing you need to know about these machines is that what it does, I mean, you will specify some architecture like this, and then what it does will depend on all of these knobs that you tweak to uh, get it all these weights, all right? Now, once we have a machine, we can talk about the accuracy of that machine. And the most obvious way is to ask what fraction of your data set is it giving the right answer, right? If the answer is, you know, if it's, if it's a bicycle and it says face, then that's no good, right? Um, but we're gonna see that that's not a useful measure for learning. We're gonna have a more smooth uh, definition of error. And, uh, and it's just, um, given the current weights, this is a function of weights. How well does our machine do given these weights? It's you sum, this is the symbol of sum, you sum over all the training data of, of how well it's doing on the training data, right? Um, and then given an error function, then you know we have our training data, we have our machine, we have our error function. And then what is machine learning? Machine learning is just this line here. It says, give me the weights that minimizes the error. That's as simple as that, right? What, which weights is going to minimize this error? And that's what we're trying to learn, right? Does that make sense? And in general, this is a very hard thing. You can't just say magically give them to me. This is some huge optimization problem, right? We're trying to minimize something. And uh, we're going to do that using um, gradient descent, which is a standard optimization. You know, Newton did this kind of thing. All right. Now, once we have our machine, right, we build our optimal machine. It does really well on the training data. That's great. And uh, then Google says, um, it's time to drive our car out of the Google parking lot. And uh, let's hope it doesn't kill anybody, right? So. The, the question is, when it's driving out in the world, it's going to see data that it's never seen before, right? So, oh, here's the, right, here's a piece of a data that we've never seen before, and we don't have the supervisor's answer for it, and we want to know how well does the machine do, and that's just a big question mark, right? We, so, that, those were our topics, all right? And what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, um, go through those topics again, 
one at a time and uh, expand and tell you more about them. All right. So the first topic was our training data. And here in this graph, you might have noticed that uh, we are kind of pretending that X is one real number along the, the, the horizontal and Y is one real number along the vertical. But we're just pretending that so that we can get a nice picture. Um, so as such, each of our training data is one of these dots, right? It has for each X, right? We, we have lots of these training data. And for a particular one, the deep one, we have an X value, that's the input. And we have a Y value, that's the supervisor's answer. And, uh, but in reality, uh, this X value could be something really complex like uh, an image, in which case it's hard to plot it down here, but you know, let's just uh, work with this picture because it's a pretty picture, right? And so there's our image. And uh, what, what does the, the supervisor provide is the why. Well, if the definition of a regression is that the, the answer why is a real number, but um, in our example, we're doing more categorizing, in which case the answer is a label. Hey, this is a bicycle, this is a face, right? So there's another way of visualizing this training data. Um, in this picture, we are assuming each X value is, is one real number. Here, I'm assuming it's two real numbers, so I can plot it in, uh, in, in two coordinates. Um, but really, you know, the each X value has uh, thousands and thousands of, of values. So this this X value is sitting in a in a very high dimensional space, right? But this picture kind of shows you something. And then what are the colors, right? We will we will color each point. Maybe the blues specify that it's a cat, and the red specifies that it's a dog and the yellows are faces, right? And so this is our training data and our goal is to classify the, the red versus the blues, right? Now, just to get a, a sort of a glimpse of what a daunting task this is, right? Uh, the, our image, here's an image of a cat, right? And you look at it and you say cat, um, but it's, it's really stored as this huge file of numbers. Of, and uh, how can you possibly look at this whole file of real numbers and know that it's a cat, right? We have no idea how a human does it. And we know how, how no idea how uh, a neural net does it or, or how we're gonna learn it. But that's certainly the task. From somehow by looking at this big file of numbers, we have to learn to recognize that it's a cat. All right, so that's our training data. Everybody getting training data? So, so let's now talk about our machine, right? So as I told you, a machine is gonna take some X value as input. It's gonna return some Y value. And it's what it does is dictated by these weights. What are these weights? their real value parameters. I'm doing this because I'm thinking about as being a knob on your machine that you can turn all these dials, right? You have, you have thousands and thousands of dials and you can turn each of one to get it to do what you want. Um, in general, what are these parameters? Well, anything that the, the learning process remembers, right? As it's learning and it's looking at your training data, and it's remembering something about the training data uh, will be these parameters. And what do they do with those parameters in the end? They're later going to make predictions on what the answer uh, will be on data it hasn't seen before, right? So any, any way that any parameters that it sets during the learning process, right, are going to be our, our weights, all right? Now, let's go back to uh, the 80s or maybe even before, I, don't, I did it in the 80s, um, uh, where we're trying to fit, we're trying to do linear regression, right? We're trying to fit the best line to a bunch of data. And 
what might this, right? The inputs, each each input is a bunch of input numbers, and the output is some real, real input, you know, real number. And uh, and what might they be? Well, the output, well, all our training data might be talking about different days. And then if we're talking about the particular day, little d is a particular day, then the answer for the day will be uh, the likelihood that it rains. And then the input for the day will say, what do we know about that day? Well, we're gonna know many features about that day. And the first feature we know about that day might be whether or not there are clouds. And the second feature, oh, I, I meant to come up here and add a, a, a new feature. Let's stick in a feature here. A feature might be whether it's sunny, right? And then a third feature might be the what shirt the guy is wearing, right? And, uh, and then each of these features, right? So each of these features is going to get some real number weight. We're going to weight them. And, uh, and you'll note that that we're gonna want a big positive weight on, on the, the feature, whether they're clouds, because when there are clouds, it's more likely to rain. But when uh, on, the, on the parameter, the feature that says how sunny it is, we're gonna want a big negative weight because when it's sunny, it's less likely raining. And similarly, when you have, uh, you know, the color of the feature, which says what kind of shirt is the man in the picture wearing, right? then we're going to want kind of a zero weight because that doesn't have any influence on whether it's raining or not right and so then how does given these weights how do we compute well we take each feature and we multiply it by its corresponding weight and we add up and that's going to give us our value of of whether it's it's going to rain or not and how do you learn is well we're given everything in purple that's our training data and we learn by finding everything in green. Those are our weights. And the green is going to tell us, we find the, the line that best fits this data, right? And when you do that, maybe you discover something cool, like actually there is a, a correlation between what shirt the guy's wearing in rain, because if he's wearing a raincoat, then that's how I know it's gonna rain, right? So. No, so that was a linear, a linear predictor. We could be more fancy by making it, let's find the best shape polynomial or any sort of function you want here. But you'll see what we've just, we've added is we've added more purple features, right? This value squared and this value squared are just features that some, some human handpicked. Uh, in fact, I had a job as a co-op student in which I was handpicking features like this in order to fit our data. And all those features are, are computed before we do the learning process. And so the learning process is still just finding weights to balance these features. And so it's still, still basically linear regression. All right, so now let's look at a more complicated machine. This is a neural net with lots of deep layers and uh, what does it do? Well, it takes as input an image, and this image has lots and lots of pixels in it. So all of these input values here, each of those red purple dots will take one input real number, will take one real number, which will tell you uh, the brightness or the color of the corresponding pixel, right? Each of these corresponds to one of these pixels. And then these real numbers go through the neural net, right? So layer after layer of the neural net is gonna take these real numbers, process them how, and then pass them on to the next layer, which will process them how and pass them on to the next layer. And until, until the last layer, it can identify whether it's a face or not, right? And uh, let's, let's do that again. Remember each image, was one input value. And we were placing that input value as a dot in, in the vector space, the, the space of all images, right? So that's just some dot 
is representing one image in the space of all images. Well, these dots are still different, right? They're still, they're kind of telling you the location of this dot um, in the high dimensional space, right? They're telling you the value of all the pixels. All right, so let's push the button again. And again, it's gonna transform this space uh, until it can identify whether it's uh, a face or a dog or not. And if we go back to the beginning again, now I'm showing you all the all possible images. This is the whole image space, all the possible images. And they have, you know, this one's a face and this one's a cat based on their coloring. And now only one of them goes into the machine at a time, right? So what's what's being inputted here is, is just one of these images, but we can imagine uh, in, par in parallel, we can imagine what happens to all of these images as they go one layer down next, right? So all of these images by the first layer gets transformed somehow and they keep getting transformed somehow until look at now, somehow the reds and blues and yellows have been separated somewhat and we can just use kind of linear planes to, to say which ones are cats and dogs. Right, does that make sense? All right. So let's talk a little bit more about how this neural net works, right? We know that it's all modeled after the brain. And uh, you know, I don't know much about the brain, but we all know that it contains neurons and each neuron at each point in time is either firing or it's not firing. And when one neuron fires, it sends a signal along some dendrite or, or, and uh, along these, these edges here. Uh, and, and it either is encouraging the next neuron to fire or it's encouraging the next neuron not to fire, somewhat based on the weight along that path, right? And then you think about any, in, any neuron that's taking in signals, um, it's taking these signals that say fire, taking signals that say don't fire. And if that signal reaches some threshold, then it's going to fire, right? That's what all we need to know about the brain, right? So let's build an artificial neuron, right? This is one neuron. And what's the input to this neuron is this image, right? Because we're trying to recognize whether it's a, a bike or a, or a face, and we're gonna feed it into um, all of the neurons, right? Well, at least the neurons that are closest to your eye, right? So here's a neuron close to your eye, and uh, we're gonna feed in this input. Oops. And, and what is the input? As you know, it's an image that's made up of lots and lots of pixels. And so we're, we're gonna talk about the eye pixel, and so one of these columns, one of these nodes here is about the eye pixel and we feed the brightness of every pixel into this thing here. Some people like concrete numbers. And so if you think these numbers have any meaning, you're wrong. I, I just wrote numbers down, right? So I'll, I'm, I'm gonna have all my pixel values between zero and one. So these are just my saying, my first pixel has brightness 0.5 and my second pixel as brightness 0.3 and see how I'm feeding them in. My last pixel has brightness 0.4, right? And uh, so that's how we're inputting the image. It's just uh, all these real values coming in. And then these are all edges saying, how is this pixel gonna influence the firing of this neuron? And each of these edges has a real number weight. So let's just, write down some real numbers, right? So this, uh, the first pixel is gonna influence the firing of this neuron weighted by four versus the second one is weighted by negative two, right? So the first pixel is gonna encourage the, the, the neuron to fire where the second pixel is gonna discourage the neuron from firing. And how do we do that? Is we take each incoming number and we multiply it by its corresponding weight. And then we add them all up. All right, so here what we're doing is we're taking 
this number times this number plus this number times this number plus this number times this number all added up. That's all we're doing, right? We're taking what's called a weighted sum, right? And, uh, and what about this funny little edge here? You might have noticed it. It's just so that we can learn a constant that we add in, right? That will help us set the threshold is we add in this constant, right? Does that make sense? And we just do this sum, this weighted sum, and some number comes out. Maybe it's an 18.2, it comes out. And that is going to be our Z value, right? Our, our neuron is taking all these signals in, there's a weighted sum to give us this is its signal, right? And so now it has to decide whether to fire or not, whether this signal has reached the threshold. So let's get ourselves a threshold. That's a threshold. And uh, Y, what's the output Y is, is going to be Boolean, yes, no, zero, one, right? Why is that? Well, because in our brain, the, the neuron either fires or it doesn't fire, right? The picture is either a cat or it's not a cat, right? So we want the Y to be zero, one. And the way we're gonna model this is we're gonna feed this Z number through this threshold. And uh, let's sort of study this graph here. If the Z value, is some positive number, here's Z along here. If Z is positive, then the output is gonna be one, right? Versus if the Z is some negative value, so here the Z values over here is negative, then you can see the output is gonna be zero, right? It's just basically says Y is one if Z is greater than zero and else Y is zero, right? It's a simple threshold. Now you might say the threshold's all at zero. Remember, but we added that eight in so we can shift the threshold. All right, does that make sense? Yeah, so like to mention here, it depends on like the values that when you add up. Sometimes right. when you get, and also and then also that depends on what functions you're using as well. If your exactly. values are, are too high, then you would have to use another function to make them, to squeeze them more lower. And if the right. values are too right. close to zero, then you have to, yeah, exactly. All we're learning, what we learn is these green values. And then once we have the green values are fixed, then the machine is just going to take this linear sum. That's going to give me some Z value. And we feed that Z value into this threshold and it fires or it doesn't fire. Right. And we call this a linear separator because it's this line. Right. We've done a linear operation and we separate out when we say fire yes and when we fire no, right? Now, what can we do with these, li these linear separators? What can we do with these neurons? Well, we can easily build end gates and OR gates and not gates. Uh, and then when we have these gates, we can build a computer. So with these neurons, you can definitely build the laptop that's sitting in front of you. All right, that there's no issues about computing power. It can compute anything computable, right? But what we care about here is learning, right? Your laptop sitting in front of you isn't going to learn by itself. And uh, what's the problem with learning is you see this sharp threshold? It's going to make the, the landscape sharp. And what's wrong with this landscape? Well, here it's really flat and then you fall off a cliff, and then it's really flat again. And remember you, you're blindfolded. So imagine you're walking around in this landscape and you're trying to find a valley blindfolded. How do you find the valley um, without dying, right? That's just seems too hard. Um, you're gonna learn much better. You're gonna find that valley much better if the landscape was more gentle, right? So if you were blind on this hill, you would just know which direction was down and you would walk down and you would find the valley, right? So our goal now is to switch from these hard, sharp edges to a graceful edge, right? That's what we're gonna do. And why are we doing it? We're doing it so that we can do hill climbing. We want things to be graceful. 
And uh, the way we do it is we're no longer going to make everything yes, no. We're gonna allow there to be some maybe so in the middle, all right? And so the way we do it is we just replace this threshold function with this function, which is called the sigmoid function, all right? And so let's see how the sigmoid function works. Suppose the weighted sum, the real value that we're getting in is the same really big positive number we got before. Well, before what we got was one, but now you can see it doesn't give you quite one, right? It gives you something close to one. And similarly, if we had some big negative value um, before it gave us zero, but now it's going to give us something close to zero. Uh, but the new thing is suppose we're in the middle. Now, instead of falling off the cliff, it's going to be graceful and it's going to give us some value sort of in the middle. All right. So that's, that's this here describes our, our neuron. All right. And what are we going to do with all of these neurons? We're going to layer them. All right. So that triangle is one neuron and we build them, right? So there's one neuron, there's one neuron, there's one neuron right? These are all neurons, right? And we layer each, neur each neuron is fed by the layer before it and decides whether to, right? Each, each neuron, this neuron right here, it decides whether to fire based on the, the incoming values, right? Um, and so, okay, what are we going to do with this? As before, we're going to feed in the, the image and as before, uh, right, it, so we're gonna feed in the image here and uh, we have our lower weights and what's the required output to be? Well, the required output is gonna be whether it's a cat or a dog or a face. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna have one wire coming out, uh, giving us one real number uh, for each of the possible labels. And, um, each of these numbers is going to be between zero and one. And we're going to add this extra condition. The extra condition is that these values are going to add up to one. And why do we do that is so that we can pretend that the machine is telling us that the probability that the input is a bike is 92%. Now, is there a probability distribution here? Absolutely not. Right, this 92 is just some number that is returned by our machine. And we're going to interpret it as saying the machine thinks it's most likely a bike, but you know, it might be a cat, right? All right, so that's what our machine is, right? We know that these input nodes are, are giving us uh, um, pixel values, how bright the pixels are. And we know these output values are giving us how much we think it's a, it's a dog. Um, but what's this hidden node doing? It's some neuron that's firing as well. And uh, it has no meaning. Uh, maybe, right? Maybe it's saying, hey, does the image have a nose, right? Maybe it's saying that, but we don't know that, right? It has no meaning designated by, our, by a human, right? All the meaning comes from learning these weights. All right, so we have these edge weights and right this edge weight here says the influence of the i pixel on the j hidden node. And we have all of those weights. So here's a neuron and all of these pixels are gonna influence the firing of that neuron, right? And so how do we do it? Is we take some linear sum, which gives us some Z, real value Z, we feed that Z, real value Z through a sigmoid function, which gives us some zero one, some value between zero and one, right? And we do that for all of these uh, neurons. And then those values get fed into the next layer, which get fed into the next layer, so forth until we have the answer, right? So that, there's no magic here. That's all it's doing. Right, and if you trust this to drive your car, then that's what we're doing, right? We're trusting this to drive our car. But of course you're trusting your brain to drive your car and that's all your brain's doing too, right? 
So, uh, and this is all specified by the weights. All right, so that, that's our machine. That's everything I'm gonna tell you about the machine. Um, let me, let's talk now about the air surface. All right, so let's review where we're at. We have some training data that's coming in. And uh, what did we do with those training data? Well, for every setting of the weights, we can compute, the, our machine will, will look at all that training data. And uh, we're going to, given, then given weights, we're gonna ask how well does our machine do on each of these training data items? And uh, so here's the particular input. Here's the answer specified by the supervisor. And given our particular weights, we have some machine that's gonna output some answer. And here's the answer outputted by the machine. And <clears throat> the most obvious thing to say is, well, did it get the right answer or not, right? And uh, that's sort of a yes, no, hard thing. And remember what our problem with hard things is, is that you, you have these cliffs and it's hard to learn with cliffs. So instead, we're going to make an error function that's smoother. And how are we gonna make it smooth? Well, let's pretend for the moment that these aren't uh, labels of cats and dogs, but the output Y is some real number. And so the number that the supervisor wants is a real number. The machine is giving some real number. And the obvious thing to do is to subtract. Right? And so we subtract those and we get some real number and we say, okay, great. Then we go, that's, we, we, we put that there. And then we come over to the next training data and uh, we subtract off the two answers, the answers of the supervisor and the answer of the machine again. And uh, we get another number, but note the difference is our second number was negative. Why? Because the machine's error was in the opposite direction, right? And the first one, the machine gave an answer that was uh, too low. In the second one, he gave an answer that was too high, right? And so we have positive and negative errors and we don't like that. We don't like positive and negative numbers, right? So what we're gonna do with all of these numbers is we're gonna square them. And why do we square them? A number of reasons, right? Here, we just squared each of them. The first reason for squaring them, I alluded to already, is that if you take a positive number and you square it, you get a positive. You take a negative number and you square it, you get a positive. So squaring things makes all the numbers positive, right? Now, we could have used absolute value signs instead. We could have just made the numbers positive, but let's hold off on that. Uh, another advantage of this is that squaring it makes big errors bigger, right? If you take one and you square it, you get a one, all right? But if you take a 10 and square it, right, you get a hundred. And that's, right, that's getting a bigger error and maybe you wanna do that, right? But you could go back and say, why don't we instead take absolute values? And absolute values, again, have these, these thresholds where you go from it's positive to negative and that switches you values quickly. And we don't, we don't like these type thresholds. And uh, if, we, if we did absolute values, our math would be, would be absolutely impossible. And so instead we, we take, we square things because everything is smooth and differentiable. All right, so we, that's what we're doing is we take, we take the difference for each of our training data we take the difference we square the number and then we add them all up, right? So this symbol here is the sum symbol. It says sum over all our training data. Uh, uh, what do we sum up? The value that the supervisor wants minus the value that the machine gave us. We take the difference and we square it. It's called sum squared error. Sum squared error, you may have heard it before. It, it's certainly, certainly that's what I did in the 80s, all right? Um, and this is going to be called our error function. And you'll note it's a function of the weights. Why? Because we're assuming the training data is fixed. We're assuming the architecture is fixed. All that we're playing with is the weights. And if you change the weights, it changes what the machine does, right? 
So here we're going to plot that. Along here, we'll, we'll plot which weights we have. And then up here, we'll plot um, what our error was, right? For these weights, our error turned out to be 289, right? But let's, let's try some different weights, right? Instead of these weights, let's look at these weights over here. Then, right, we have the same machine, the same data, but we have different weights, right? We have the light green weights and we have the dark green weights. And if you feed all the training data through them, you're going to get different answers. And hence, uh, here's the different answers given by our machine is the dark green answer. And uh, the error is going to be different. If you compute the error, then maybe in this case, we're going to get 400 error. And so we can plot here, these weights has 400 error while these plots have 200 error. And you say, which weights are better? Well, the one that's better are the ones that has the smaller error, right? And again, we could do the same thing for every setting of the weights, but that would be computationally way too expensive. But as a thought process exercise, we can imagine we do it for every setting of the weights and we get some um, weight curve, right? Some weight surface here. And that's, uh, th so sorry, not some weight surface, some error surface, right? For each weight, we calculate what the error is and that gives us this curve, which tells us the error for every setting of the weights, right? And so what's machine learning is we're given the training data, we're given the definition of the machine, and we're given the definition of what our error is. You give, in fact, right now, you give all of those things to Google and Google will give back to you the weights that minimize the error, right? So in our picture, that there is the minimum error, but we don't care about the minimum error. What we care about are which weights give you the minimum error. And we write that down as arg min. Arg min tells me, give me the weights that give me the minimum error, right? Don't give me the minimum error. Give me the weights that give me the minimum error. That's the arg part. All right, does that make sense? All right, so we're back to our neural net here. And uh, in this picture, we're kind of assuming that we only have one weight because we're plotting along this one dimension. But if we had two weights, then we can locate our machine in, in a, a longitude and latitude, and we have our machine somewhere. And then for each setting of the weights, we had our error. And then we did that for, every, you know, here's for that setting of the weights. And then for this setting of the weights, we had a different error. And if we did that for every setting of the weights, we would have an error surface, right? And our goal is to find the optimal values, which are down here in the value valley, right? Does that make sense? All right. Now, in reality, as I, we keep having to switch back to reality so we know what's happening, reality, we have thousands of weights. And, uh, and so we're, we're blind in this thousands of dimensional space. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're up against, you might look at this picture over here and say, hey, dude, just try all the weights. You want to, you want to minimize something over all weights? Just try them all, right? That's easy. All right, well, let's think about that. Suppose we have 10,000 weights and each weight is, has 10 possible values. Then how many settings are there of the weights, right? You have 10 choices for the first weight, 10 choices for the second, 10 for the third. That means you have 10 to the 10,000 ways of setting these weights. And if you don't know, that's a big number, right? So to give you a flavor of how much time it would take to try all of these possibilities, it's put a supercomputer, the best computer ever, on each atom in the universe and have it that it compute for the age of the universe. And you wouldn't even make the smallest dent in trying all of these, right? So it's just not the way you do things. You don't try them all. All right, so instead, right, we're going to try to do um, gradient descent. 
And in order to do gradient descent, we need this differentiable function. And what do I mean by a differential function? Well, what I mean is that if I make a small change, an infinitesimal change in one of the weights, right? I move my location infinitesimally, then each of the Z values is just the sum of, of, you know, here's the weight. You make a small change in that weight. It's going to make a small infinitesimal change in that Z value. And then we pass it through the sigmoid function, right? So it's going to make a small change in the output of that, which in the end is going to bubble through and it's going to make a small change in the output of the, our machine, which then we measure the error. It's going to make a small change in the error. And that's why we have this smooth error function, right? You, if you make a, take a small step, it only makes a small change in your height. You're not falling off any cliff, right? Does that make sense? All right, so that's all we had to say about air surfaces. And uh, we're flying right along here. Let's talk about uh, what we came here to talk about, which was machine learning, all right? Mm -hmm. So we started with, in the 80s, learning uh, the best curve, the best uh, polynomial that to fit this data, uh, which is just the linear combination of our purple features, right? All the green are just coefficients on our purple features, just multiply, add. And, um, and you can, I was going off to a job up, up at a hospital and they wanted to, to me to optimize something. And I just did the calculations on the back of an envelope it's easy to see, um, come up with a formula that will give you the, the, the optimal weights, all right? Um, and because everything is linear, all right? On the other hand, if you have something nonlinear, uh, the joy of nonlinear things is you can compute so much more, but the problem with it is that learning becomes so much harder, all right? And so now, what we're going to do it is, as I said, we're going to start with some random value of the weights, and we're going to keep making infinitesimal changes, um, making it better and better. And we're going to have our supervisor help us tell us which weights to increase and which weights to decrease. All right. And this process is called gradient descent. All right. Oops. So let me first tell you briefly what's happening here, right? If this was our error surface, we're gonna start in a random location. And if you started there, you would do gradient descent down to A, but here, if you started here, you go down to B, if you started here, you go down to C, right? So there's no guarantee we're gonna get the overall optimal, right? But hopefully you find what this is called the local optimal, and hopefully we find a local optimal that's good enough. Um, Actually, I got this picture from a discussion where maybe actually B is a better solution than C because even though the air is slightly worse, it's a wider valley. And so you, you can build more houses down there, right? You can, maybe it'll, it will um, generalize to other data better, but because you have a wider valley. Anyway, that's what our goal is, right? So how are we gonna do the learning, right? Well, we need to find the direction of steepest descent. And if you're standing on this hill, um, I, I assume you know that this path and both the path that the walker is taking and the path that the skier is taking is not the steepest descent. And why is because they don't want to tumble down the hill. They want to um, walk slowly down the hill. So they're taking a, a, a slow path. What, what would the fast path be is the direction that the water flow flowed, right? If you, if you dumped a bunch of water here, it would flow like a tornado down this hill. And that's what we're gonna do, all right? So here we have our, our hill. And uh, as I said, we asked my son how to get to the bottom. And he says, just keep going down. Right, and so how do we find our weights to minimize this error? Is we start with random weights, then here we are with some random location, 
and then we do lots of computation to compute what our current error is and to compute what direction to head and how steep it is. And based on that, we decide some small step that we're going to take, right? We take some small step and, uh, and then we're going to repeat that, right? We, again, we know where we are. We take, we calculate the steepest direction. We take some, some small step and we keep doing that until we get the bottom of, and when are we at the bottom of the valley? It's when every direction is up, right? When water is, is pooling down there. If water is pooling down there, then you know you're done. And, uh, and you just hope that that's a good solution, right? And uh, you, you stop, all right? And that's, I'm gonna call this the optimal weights, but really optimal in quotation marks because they're only locally optimal, all right? And remember again that this is some high dimensional space and, and computational is expensive, right? So what's really happening is what you know is your current value of your weights. And then you do huge amount of computation to calculate the error on those for those weights. And then you do another huge amount of computation to compute your direction. And then you take a little step in that direction and then you repeat, right? You compute your, your error, you compute your direction and you take a step. So how is that done? Well, how do you compute, given their current weights, how do you compute the error? Well, we have our, we put those weights on our machine, right? Each weight specifies uh, is, is, is the weight of an edge. We feed all the training data through, each training data through here one at a time. The values propagate forward until you get the answer for each training data. Of course, you can do them all in parallel. Um, and then you have all the training, the answers for the machine, the, the answers the machine's giving. So you can calculate, compare those to the answers of the supervisor. You can calculate the error. All right, so that's calculating error feed forward. You might've heard these words. Then we calculate the derivatives. We calculate the slopes by doing feed backwards. We know the errors. So then we ask, how do these numbers influence the errors? How do these numbers influence the errors? And you keep going back and you can say, how does this weight here, if I made a little change on this weight here, how does it influence the error? We want to know um, for every weight, if you were to change that weight a little bit, does it make the error better or worse, right? Um, all right, we're, we're moving along, running out of time. So now let's talk about um, our, our last topic, which is generalizing the data, the generalizing um, from uh, new problems we've never seen before, right? So what's happened? We were in the Google parking lot. We had lots and lots of, of training data. We uh, used our learning to learn the weights and that was great. And it's optimized, right? We optimized this function to do as best on the training data as we possibly could. And now, and see here, this input, it's, you know, we're trying to get it so it gets the right answer from all the training data. That was great. And now we're ready to leave the Google parking lot and we're gonna see data that we have never seen before. And it's gonna have answers um, that we've never seen before. And we have no supervisor to tell us the answer. And we wanna know how well would this machine do on this data it's never seen before. And, uh, and it's a big question mark, right? It's a big question mark. So um, let's try to understand it by looking at three examples, all right? In the, and you'll note in all three of these examples, we have the exact same training data and we learned three different machines. And so the first question you could ask is which of these three machines does the best on the training data, right? And if you look, oh, this machine does best on the training data. In fact, you can see it gives the perfect answer on the training data, right? But then you could ask, which one do you think is gonna give the best answer on data you've never seen before? 
And I hope that your intuition will be the middle guy, right? And um, well, one thing is we can prove is this thing called the no free lunch theorem, which means no method that you come up with will always find, will, will always be able to generalize well, but there are some, um, some ideas that hopefully we can, principles that we can use. And the principles are underfitting versus overfitting. All right, so what's, what's underfitting? Underfitting is when your machine, you can see this machine here, just doesn't have the capacity to learn our training data. It's just not gonna learn the training data, right? And so it's certainly not gonna generalize because it can't even learn the training data. That's called underfitting. Overfitting is when you have such a powerful machine, it can absolutely learn the answers for all your training data. Um, and the way it does it is by it just copies down all the answers. It has enough power to write down all your answers. And if you did that on your test, you copy down everything the teacher said, um, you would probably learn, learn nothing. And you, when a new question comes on the exam, you would be stuck, right? So how should you study for a course instead is you should take all the material taught in the course and you should compress it. You should summarize all the material down to a little piece of paper. And in order to do that, in order to do that summary, hopefully you understood it somehow, right? And then hopefully when you have a new question, um, you, can, you can answer it better because you've, you've summarized the material. In order to summarize the material, you had to understand the patterns in the data, all right? And this somewhat comes from, you probably have all heard of Ockram's razor. He, it, it was fundamental in, in advancing science. He said, if you have two models of lightning, one that talks about electricity, one that talks about the gods, then go with the one that, see, that explains the, 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 the data in the simplest possible way. And uh, that was Occam's razor. All right, so we're, we're moving along. I, I, I think we can uh, finish these slides. What do we mean by compression, right? I was talking about compressing the, the, the information. Well, the complexity of my machine is gonna be how many weights do I have, right? If I have more weights, then I'm, I'm somehow, uh, I'm, I have more power. Right, and so here we have a hundred weights. Here we have a thousand weights. Here we maybe have twenty thousand weights. Right, and how big is our data set? Well, maybe our data set only has ten thousand. Right, we have ten thousand data set. Well, this machine has twenty thousand values that it's learning with. Right. Um, now, these these answers, these Y values are somehow, they can be reproduced from the weights. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's suppose that the input, the X values are fixed. Everybody knows the X values, right? And what we're trying to learn is the Y values. Then if we know the X values and we know the weights, you can plug all the, the images through and that will give us the Y values, right? So from the weights, we can reproduce the Y values, right? So, and that means in some ways, right? These 10,000 numbers, which are our Y values are encoded into these M weights, right? We've encoded them in, right? Because we can get the Y values back. And how did we do that encoding? How did we do that encoding? Is well, we had the Y values and we had the input Xs and we did machine learning to learn the weights, right? So from the Y values, we learn the weights. That's an encoding process. And how do we decode is, well, you know the weights and you know the X images, you can recover the Y values, right? So that's an encoding and a decoding, right? So that's compression. It's like any, any compression that you would do. You have some image, you wanna shrink it so it can fit on your file better and you wanna recover the image back again. That's compression, right? And we're compressing with fewer values, right? So here, if we compress these 10,000 values into 100 values, we're just not gonna be able to recover the 10,000 values, right? 
And uh, here we're doing some compression, right? We're compressing a thousand values, 10,000 values into a thousand values, right? That's a tenfold we're making our data smaller, right? While here there's no compression at all, right? You can certainly with 10, remember 10,000 numbers if you have, if you can store 20,000 numbers, right? So no compression. All right, so we're running out of time, but let me give you this, this picture here. It's a really cool picture. Um, the, the horizontal axis is um, how complex our machine is. Here we're saying it's complex by how many numbers are used to describe the machine. And our vertical axis, right, is going to measure how many errors does the best machine of this complexity, how many errors does it have? And we have two curves. The first curve is how well does the machine do on the training data, right? And you can see that the more complex your machine is, the better it does in the training data, up to the point where it gets all of the right answers on the true training data, right? It just perfectly can memorize the answers on the training data, all right? But what about the other curve? The other curve is how well it does on general inputs. And you'll see down here, we have underfitting. The machine's just not complex enough to learn anything, right? Well, here, it can memorize the answers for the training data, but it doesn't do well on, on, on data it's never seen before because it's never really actually had to learn anything, right? But in the middle here, it had to take those 10,000 numbers and compress them into 1,000 numbers. So it needed to learn some pattern of those 10,000 numbers. And by that, it can then generalize better, right? So our goal is to find this sweet spot, to find the machine that's sitting right here, right? And how do we do it? Well, one way of doing it is a thing called regularization, right? So what it does is it tries to find the best weights that not only minimizes the, the error on the training data, right? That's what we were trying to do before. We were trying to minimize, find the weights that minimize the error in the training data, right? But now we're also trying to find the weights that are somehow are not too complex. We also, we want this distance to be small and this distance to be small. And we're gonna do some trade-off between the two. And hopefully that will find us in the sweet spot where we, we generalize well, all right? Now, the, I told you that the measure of the machine was how many weights we have, but that's hard to change as you go. So instead, we're going to have to be the measure of the machine be the sum of the squares. And you'll see if you have lots of big weights, then the n's big. But if you have lots of weights that are close to zero, then our weight's small. And this also is a differential function. So we can, we can do hill climbing. We can do gradient descent here. All right. And... Uh, Okay, we have two more slides. The, the second last slide gives us a little theory. The theory is what we're assuming is that the universe has a probability distribution on our input images X, our input images, right? So we randomly choose our input images and we label them with whether it's a cat or dog. And then we find some machine that does well in the training data. And we do it with the machine that didn't memorize the answers, right? It had to do some sort of compression. Then you can prove, formally prove, and we will do that in our third talk. We will prove that with high probability, if you take more, tra more data from the same distribution that we took before, then data that you've never seen before, then your machine will, high probability will do well on that machine, that new data as well, all right? And one last slide, um, because I know we're all tired, is about singularity. We all know that um, the technology is growing at an exponential rate, but actually, if you tweak the differential equation slightly, it it's no longer grows exponentially, but it reaches at infinity, at some point in time. And if at 12 o'clock, it's modeled to have an infinite amount of 
of um, technology, then what does the world look like after this? And um, that's the question we're going to leave you with here. Oh, I lied to you. I have more slides. All right. We have seven talks scheduled. And we, we just did the first one. And if this amused you, we can go into further talks. The, the next talk is going to be more for people who don't know mathematics at all. We're going to review algebra. We're going to talk about linear separators. We're going to talk about matrix multiplication. We're going to talk about derivatives. We're going to talk about back propagation. And my fear is this is way too much for one talk. And so maybe we'll stick some on other talks which are shorter. Then, as I told you, the second talk will be how we generalize to data we haven't seen before. And then this one is how do you learn how to make a margarita um, when the reward comes later. Um, and if we have time, we can talk about other types of models. And then uh, here we're going to talk about statistics on how we can take lots of numbers and compress them into fewer numbers. Um, I think these are cool. These are a model where you have um, some distribution that you're going to learn, right? You want to you want to you watch people. This is you watch people make art, and now you want to make new art that no one's made before. Right, so you learn the distribution, what does art look like? We can learn about clustering. And then our last talk um, will be a more of an open discussion about ethics. And I finish, oh, then there are more things that I could teach you if you want, and that's the end. All right, so we now have exactly five minutes for questions. Uh, should we open the floor to anybody who wants to talk? Thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat box. I don't see any questions, so please feel free to unmute yourself, ask any question, or just write it down on the chat box so um, and I can help with reading that over. I have a, I have a question there. Um, my name is Brendine. I'm a professor at, at Humber College. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this talk. I built a neural network in 1996, um, and I wish I would have had your talk back then to give me the basics instead i was reading you know simon haken's book and and figuring out myself and i built something that i trained on a 486 and it took days and and there it was but the one question that i had that came out of that you know when i was talking about it with people and i haven't delved into that area since you know if you're training something say you know can you see tanks uh in this photo right can you find tanks in this photo um and you, like you said, you don't really know what it's doing. So you think you're training it for tanks. Right. But what if you're really training it for like trees on the left and, you know, right. something dark in the other corner? You know what I mean? Right. Like, and these are, you know, I, I like things to be very black and white. So even though I, I love the, the magicalness of these, there's a part of me that is always like, but, 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 right? Exactly. 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 And I, uh, I can't say anything answering you except exactly. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just glad that I'm not I'm not the only one that, that no, is, you know. No, that's the right? classic. It's what are we learning here, right? And and uh, that's where you go out into the world and you suddenly realize, no, I didn't learn. All I learned was was the color of the whether it was sitting on grass or whether it was sitting on pavement, right? Yeah. And what's, I mean, that's the whole ethics question, right? What, what yeah. are we learning about black people? What are we learning about anything? Yeah. And one thing I want to point out from what the, the person said is there's nothing here that I said that I didn't learn as a graduate student in, in the 80s, right? There's just no, no new math. All that we have different is more data and faster computers. And, and I'm glad we have faster computers. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for Thank your you. question. That was great. I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. Any other thoughts? Uh, hi, Professor. Hi. It is a fabulous session. I thoroughly enjoyed your class today. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, I just saw a picture of Armel. I, I, Armin and I worked together in Africa.
Any other thoughts? Um, hi, Professor. I really enjoyed your presentation, every part of it. Um, it I'm not intrigued. Like I, I chat, wrote in the chat, I'm intrigued to know more about machine learning now, and I'm eager to learn more. Uh, much as I would like to do that, I didn't really understand a lot of the things you said. But yeah, I would love to learn more. Excellent. I'm just a novice at this, so. <laughs> well, well, and well, let me add something other. I do think this is something everybody can learn. And I do think that if we have jobs in the future, they will be in this field, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And social sciences of how to be nice to each other. Mm -hmm. But the, if, you, if you're hoping to get a job coding, they probably won't be, you know, that's, this is the future of coding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to see what uh, you're going to say in the next session. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, Jeff, there's a question in the chat there, um, and it's just sort of disappearing in the scroll. So it's saying um, that someone is very interested in theoretical machine learning now, mainly the proofs, any way to help Jeff, and are you doing research in that direction? Me. I'm hoping to do research. I, I, I grabbed last term, Lear, I grabbed a, a, a student who wanted to do uh, machine learning and we did um, a paper on fairness and it just, it just got accepted into a conference. So that's, now I have one paper in a machine learning conference. Um, and if people wanna work on things together, let's do it. Uh, I'm in my 2000, my second year, class, we're going to get people to try to do some machine learning. And uh, I'm teaching a course next term in Africa and machine learning. But York won't let me teach machine learning because they need me to teach algorithms. But Thanks. certainly thousands of papers get written every year on this topic. Um, I don't see any other questions on the chat. Obviously, there are a lot of comments about how good this presentation was. So, All right. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much. And um, let me say, oh, let me say something. Uh, can you still see my screen? On the bottom there is, uh, oops, bottom somewhere. I lost it. Let me put in the chat. I think I still have it. There is, um, I made a web page that listed all the topics for the seven uh, things. And um, I will hopefully get um, the videos from this and I will link them in there too. So you can look at that link and, and see what's happening. Thank you, Jeff. Um, right. I do see there are a couple of questions about the uh, recorded sessions, if that's going to be shared and how you're going to find the link for the next class. Uh, Mariam, Ida, are you here to um, answer that question? Yeah, so um, all the classes are already posted on um, IEEE VTools. I can share that link in the chat so that everyone can have access to it. Uh, you can register through VTools, and from there, I'll be able to um, share the Zoom link in the morning, like maybe a day before or in the morning of the class because of um, security. Uh, so I'll, I'll share the link in the chat box right now. And where will the videos go? Uh, the videos, they can be uploaded to YouTube. It's up to you if you give permission. Uh, we have an IEEE YouTube page that we uh, usually upload the, um, the seminars and the sessions there. I can also share the um, link after um, it's uploaded. Excellent, excellent. I, that would be great. And if you give me the link, then I will put the link on that my own personal webpage so people can find it there too. Yeah, yeah, for sure, that would. Thank you. <coughs> Um, Armel's question, I, I don't know if anybody's going to be emailing anybody. So um, these talks are happening this time every week for the next six weeks. And uh, 
you can email me or go to my webpage and find, I'll try to put a post, anything, anything I know I'll put there. All right, are we done? I think so. All right, Thank well, thanks so to much. everybody. Jeff, Thank you. Could you please just wait a couple of minutes whenever oh. actually, yeah, so, sorry for that. Oh, no, so no, no, thank no, you, no. everyone. I'm... Yeah, thank you, everyone. For... Thank you. Thanks, everyone, yeah, for joining today. It. Thank you. Thank you. So thank great. you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. See you guys next week. It was great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye bye, oh, everybody. Just, just one, I should bye -bye. to make sure. Jeff, sorry for bothering. We want actually to make sure that everything is aligned with the, the, the being a host or co-host. Sorry for that. Oh, no so, problem. Maybe for the next few weeks, I can take on the co. We'll see if uh, I think in the Zoom you can actually have a co-host, but it needs to be scheduled like the right. meeting needs to be scheduled like that. So maybe from next time we'll make sure it happens, so you don't have to do that. But Excellent. thank you so much. Jeff. No so um, I, I tried to do that. Apparently, um, it depends on the type of a Zoom account that you have. Um, it only allows me to choose one host for the for the whole event. But I'll um, I'll I'll uh, follow up to see if there's any way that I can make a co-host for, for the. Yeah. And I think probably I the only main issue is once we've started, is there a way to just say people can come in, get rid of the waiting room? Yeah, um, what we never know if it's something happened, it would be better that someone else has also have the control. So right. to mute someone or for right. example, so right. today it happened a couple of times I decided to mute someone, but right. uh, I have no power. So right, thank right. you. It was a great presentation. I really enjoyed the session and uh, just whenever actually we are closing everything, Jeff, it may happen that you get the Greek cord. I'm not sure because you were the host, final oh, host, right. it may happen that it comes to you. As, oh, as Again, an email maybe? No, it comes and sits on your machine. So accept it if it happens. All right, well, I, I turned on the recording and, uh -huh. and I pushed um, record to cloud. Okay, that's okay. So we will see that. So okay. it shouldn't come to me, it should come to, to somewhere that you have yeah. access to. Okay, thank you. That would be awesome. So Ida, can you follow up with those things? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. thank you. I really thank appreciate you. everyone. Thank you, Nadia. Thank yeah, you, Ida. It was and lots of fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. If next time we can't figure out the co-host part, I'll volunteer my hand to host. So Jeff, you don't have to worry about that next Excellent. time. So. Thanks so much. And yeah. um, if anybody gets any sense, so the next talk is is doing algebra. So, so Again, I need to know what level to put it at, right? I'm, am I talking to, you know, Jake was here. Am I leaning it to Jake or am I leaning it to that professor who was talking, right? It's a, it's, so, a, it's a very different algebra talk. Yeah, maybe it's up to you. All You're right. an expert. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Make it easier. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a nice day, actually, evening. All Take right. care. Thanks everyone. so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Love Have you. a great evening. Bye. 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 Bye.